anybody else need a handout tonight? Okay. So, um, if you were with us last week, actually, let me address those who weren't with us last week. Uh, we covered the Genesis chapter 1 through 11, which is really the beginnings of everything. Uh, Genesis is split into two sections, mainly. Uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is uh, creation, fall, flood, and then the scattering of nations uh, after the Tower of Babel. And then after chapter 11, there's a big shift in the, in, the, in the focus of Genesis. And what happens is it goes from the nations and, and large genealogies of, of people as they settled um, into uh, the focus on one family that God, uh, that God actually created out of just a, an old man and an old woman who were barren. And, uh, and you'll know that to be Abraham, Sarah, and then his, his, uh, his, his descendants. But I wanted to real quick walk you through... Um, well, actually, I want to draw your attention to this from last week. Genesis 3, you'll remember in the fall, in, in the Garden of Eden, uh, humans denied God's authority. Uh, Adam and Eve, they denied uh, the, the place that God had, the right that he had to tell them, you will not eat uh, from the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they denied God's authority, and they received their consequence. And then in Genesis 11, humans tried to initiate to get God localized on their terms. What I mean by that is, as we finished off last week, we talked a little bit about at, at the Tower of Babel, what that tower was is what we know to be called uh, ziggurat, a pyramid-type structure that has a large portion of it uh, as the foundation, then it gets a little smaller and a little, small, a little smaller and a little smaller until it gets to the top. Now, I had always imagined that the ziggurats were, were meant to like reach into the heavens so that people could storm heaven and take over God. But actually, if you take it in the context of, of the way that the people of the ancient Near East were, were thinking about ziggurats, was if they could create this step pyramid for the gods to come down and inhabit their temple, they could have a localized, a, a, a central god that they could watch over and care for, and that god would care for them. And so it was kind of on their terms. And that's not how God does things on our terms. Um, and in fact, it says they wanted to make a name for themselves. That wasn't the right reason to make God come down. And the ironic part in that, in that chapter of, uh, of Genesis where it talks about the, the, this uh, in Genesis 11, God came down, but he was displeased with their motives and their method for having a relationship with them. And the really cool thing is, the very next chapter, Genesis 12, God initiates a relationship with an individual, a man named Abram, and it was to restore fellowship on his terms and to make a great name for himself. Throughout the Old Testament, there's a phrase that shows up. It shows up in, in uh, Exodus, it shows up in Numbers, it shows up in Deuteronomy, it shows up sometimes in uh, ooh, Joshua or Judges, um, it shows up in Ezekiel and Isaiah, and it's this, it's the phrase where God says, um, it's where God says, <laughs> um, so that the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. That was from Joshua chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 49 has this phrase, the Lord speaks of victory over enemies so that all mankind will know that I am the Lord, your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. In Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, the nations receive revelation through the punishment that comes upon God's own people, Israel. And God says, so that the nations will know that I am the Lord when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. And then Ezekiel, there's another phrase, uh, I want to show that I'm holy so that the nations might know that I am the Lord. Now the question is, um, how is it that God makes a relationship with one person and somehow that will create a situation in which the nations will actually draw, their, their attention will be drawn on him? How is it that God wants himself to be known, but he starts with such a small, insignificant person? An old man that's way beyond childbearing. I know, we know the story that God actually allows him to bear children uh, with his wife, who's way beyond childbearing as well. But it's interesting. If you wanted to make yourself known to the world, and you wanted to reconcile yourself with the world, what would be one way you would do that? Yeah. 
by establishing a relationship with someone in power like a king. That's excellent. That makes sense, humanly speaking. Any other ideas? Yeah. Using a lot of people. If I were God and I wanted everybody to know that I were God, I would rip the heavens open at a certain time and I would thunder loud and I would show the glory and the majesty of the, the, the thousands and thousands, the, the host of heaven, the, the, the innumerable amount of angels that are at my beck and call and I would show just a glimpse of my throne and I would peel the thunder and, and make the lightning known and people would go, wow, that's a scary God. And I was worshiping the sun and I was worshiping the clouds, and I, or the rain gods. I was worshiping the gods of, of, of the, the rocks. Oh my goodness, I need to worship that one. But God didn't choose to reveal himself that way. Actually, he did by creation. But when mankind turned their back on God at creation, and God had revealed himself over and over and over in different ways, even with his mighty power at the, uh, uh, when, when Noah built his ark because of God's wrath, the people constantly, the humankind constantly decides to um, blind their eyes to God's might and his power. And so really what's interesting about Genesis is we see God not trying to make a big name from, for himself by doing something that's absolutely stunning to the world. They've had their chance. And they've, we've failed, uh, we generally, speaking humankind has failed, but instead he starts with a single relationship and he draws a man out and he does a miracle that couldn't have been done by making him actually bear a child. And it's amazing as we begin to watch this family line be in a relationship with God and, and the people of the world begin to see. Now here's the interesting thing, as you know, uh, we're centered in the, the Middle East here in the, in the world. We're on the other side of the globe. <laughs> there's South America, there's North America. But this was the known uh, uh, portion of the world that, that the Bible talks about in, in uh, the records. You've got Africa down here. You've got Asia over on the right hand, uh, eastern side. And you've got Europe over on the west. And look what's dead set in the middle. Israel, the land that God has Abraham uh, go to which he's going to, to uh, make as his, um, his focal point to the whole world. Notice that it's at the direct center of three major continents. That's so that, oh, by the way, uh, there was so much uh, arid desert land right here, all the travels that occurred, let me, uh, I'll just use my mouse, so I can't stretch with my, my two fingers here. Um, all the travel that would occur would not go through the desert and bypass Israel, but actually it would go around between the Tigris and the Euphrates, and it would come down. And so if anybody wanted to get to Africa from Asia, they would come down through this land of Israel. If anybody from Africa wanted to get to Europe, they would come up through the land of Israel. God put um, his people, or he, he promised his people the promised land in a strategic location. You could kind of uh, compare it to this being the hub of a wheel and the, the spokes being the travel places for everyone. God put his people in a really difficult spot. It's difficult because everybody knew that if you were a world power and you wanted to control, um, you wanted to control other countries and you wanted to control travel, where would you have to stop travel? <laughs> you would have to stop it somewhere right around here or right around there or right in the center there. Israel was at a strategic place militarily, economically, as travel from uh, the, the western areas of uh, the Mediterranean. There would, be, uh, there would be trade that would come through here and people would have their ships loaded and they'd dock right there and they'd, they'd, they'd undock their stuff and they'd, they'd actually... Uh, uh, sell and, and, and caravan their, their items over to Asia and make lots of money. Israel was an economic hub. It was a military hub. It was a social hub in which uh, even Rome recognized the importance of this particular spot of land. God put his people 
in the most dangerous of places, but the most strategic of places. So he, when the gospel especially had, had come, that it would spread throughout the whole wide world as people would travel to Israel uh, for, for festivals or for commerce or whatever, and then they would leave and go back to their homes and they would, they would share the gospel. Well, let's go back real quick and put a little context to where Genesis starts. Genesis starts, and I, I forgot to mention this last week, and the, uh, so I just real quick want to give you a, a, a view here of... Um, there are two thoughts of where Eden were lo was located. Eden, uh, remember, is, is uh, explained as ha being between or a place from which four rivers came out. The Tigris, the Euphrates, the Pishon, and the Gishon River. Um, and there's a possibility, uh, because the, the Tigris and the Euphrates come together right here, it's believed that the Garden of Eden might be up in this area, uh, the Ur of the Chaldeans area, um, which actually is pretty close to the Mount Ararat area. And some others believe that the Garden of Eden uh, might be in the Sumerian location where the Tigris and the Euphrates come into each other right here. They don't go f out from there. Um, and some say it's even underneath the Persian Gulf and that the water levels have risen. We don't know. But uh, this, this map's pretty interesting because it shows all the ancient ziggurats that were built uh, in the ancient days during... Uh, between Adam and Eve's time, uh, uh, up till Noah's time, and even through about 2000 BC when uh, Abraham was around. So these ziggurats had theological importance. And remember, why were the ziggurats built? Because they thought what? They could make God come down and have God in their, their own God in their own little temple. And so each of these show that there was lots of early settlement in this whole region. This is called the Fertile Crescent or the Mediterranean, uh, not the Mediterranean, Mediterranean is this, this body of water, the, uh, the Mesopotamian area, you might have heard that phrase. And then uh, lastly, we had, we had mentioned that Mount Ararat where the, the Ark had, uh, had landed is up there in what's now modern uh, eastern Turkey. And um, I'm going to take that overly off and then remind you that the, 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 uh, the historical account about the Tower of Babel occurring uh, in the plain of Shinar most likely occurred right down by uh, Babel itself. I'm going to have it zoom in on what they believe, what modern archaeologists believe was the location of the foundations of the Tower of Babel. Uh, this, this particular location is mentioned throughout history. Uh, as being a significant worship spot, and, and there's reasons to believe that that may be it, maybe not. Uh, but what's really interesting is, remember the, the, uh, the historical account of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, 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 Daniel being in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, courts and, and his city, uh, this is actually Nebuchadnezzar's old city called Babylon, and this is, by the way, in the 600 BC. <laughs> and this, by the way, is, is way back in um, around, uh, around 2500 BC. And so there, there's quite a gap of time of 2, 000, almost 2,000 years between uh, where, when this city was, was looking like this and now. But uh, actually, Saddam Hussein, uh, just a, a little factual tidbit, Saddam Hussein actually rebuilt uh, portions of the old Nebuchadnezzar city. And he used to... Um, We'll get into this a little bit later when we get to, uh, to, the, to the book of Daniel. But uh, he used to consider himself like a second Nebuchadnezzar. And he had coins minted with Nebuchadnezzar's picture of, a side, of the side of his face with Saddam Hussein's side of his face side by side on this coin. And he was pr 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 proposing that he was like the second Nebuchadnezzar of the world. Well, that didn't work out for him as we know from history. But anyways, uh, this is a significant area, the old area of Babel. All right, so now what uh, you'll find in your Bibles is this, like I mentioned, between chapter 11 and chapter 12, there's, uh, there's one of these sections of scripture that when you're reading with other people and you're reading out loud, it gets a little frustrating, sometimes a little embarrassing when somebody says, hell, would you mind reading these verses? And you, you start out and it says, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and his father, or, or, or whatever his name is, uh, two, uh, two years after the flood and Shem uh, lived and he fathered that guy's name, uh, and 500 years, and, and I've had other sons and daughters. And then sometimes you just kind of skip through those passages when you're reading on your own, you're like, whatever, 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 whatever. Okay, here's a good spot, and then it gets on with the story, right? 
I would encourage you, those are called genealogy passages where it talks about this person, had this person, had this person, had this person. I would encourage you not just to go, oh, whatever their names are, but to try to sound them out, to spell them out, to, to figure them out. Because the more you take time to read those names, the more familiar you'll become with that. And you'll begin to see patterns. You'll begin to see actually some of the names are familiar and they'll show up in different places in scripture and they'll give you some kind of some key ideas to how to understand and interpret certain things. And so the genealogy passages are really important. There's one reason why the genealogies in Genesis are important. Can anybody think of any or a reason? There's actually a few reasons. Yep. It shows the direct lineage of Jesus. That's right. In fact, the genealogies are important because of this. Um, exactly what you said, Jonah. But also, um, to add to that, I've heard from so many people, you can't really trust what the Bible says. We all know that it's myth, fable, legend. And, and the first time you hear that, you're kind of like dumbfounded because you don't know what to say because you, obviously they must have heard something that, that, that was credible and, and, and you, you just step back for a second and you go, oh, well, I just believe the Bible because it's true. And then, and then all of a sudden they, they say, well, <laughs> then you believe a bunch of fairy tales. And, you, and, and sometimes you just kind of go, oh, uh, well, uh, I guess I do. You know? and, and that kind of ends the, the argument in a very unsatisfying way. Think about this. If Genesis was actually just a bunch of fairy tales, myths, and legends, why would there be so much detail given to names that actually match the names and, and actually the, the, the linguistic pronunciation and spelling of those names matches stuff that we find from those dates, from those periods of time in, in uh, cuneiform and other texts of, of ancient Hebrew and, and other uh, historical documents that we find? Why would the Bible take so much time to explain uh, who fathered who, fathered who, after how many years and when that person died? Because, and what's really cool is you can using the genealogies and using all the numerical data that's given in Genesis, you can chart out um, the genealogies. It's, it's actually a fascinating thing for some people. I know others are just like, whatever, <laughs> and that's okay. But consider this. If it says that I'm, I'm making this up on the spot right now, so, so forgive me, but it, like, let's say it, Adam, um, <laughs> just for the sake of time, Adam was, oh dear, Maybe it's best if I, if I uh, let's go with this one. Shem was 100 years old. We'll go with one that, that I can find right away so I'm not making this up here. Shem was 100 years old when he fathered our, uh, now I have to practice my own preaching here. Ar, p, ach, shad, <laughs> ar, ka, ar, shad. How would you like that name to spell as a child? Uh, that would be a tough one to spell. I mean, Bob is a tough one for a little little toddler, but Arkashad, um, he had to learn his spelling of his name. And when Arkashad lived 35 years, he fathered Shela. And when Shela uh, lived 30 years, he fathered Eber, or Eber. Um, when Eber lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg, and when Peleg, oh, and Peleg uh, fathered um, Ru, Rio, Ru, at 32 years of age, you're getting the idea, I know, I'm, I'm not going to belabor this here, but Surig lived 30 years, uh, excuse me, Ru lived 30 years, and he fathered Serug, and Serug lived, oh, uh, thir uh Oh, uh, I think I goofed up on one, but for the sake of the argument here, he fathered Nahor at that time. What you can do is you can actually add these up, and you, be, you actually can figure out from this time when Shem, how old he was, when uh, he had his son, 135, 165, 199, uh, 100, and, and we'd have to do the math as we went down. You can actually come up with a chronology using the genealogy, using all of the, um, the data given. Here's the, here's the really interesting part. I just gave you the one from uh, Noah's son Shem all the way to uh, Nahor, who was uh, Abraham's brother uh, under, oops, I, I 
apparently I forgot Terra or something, but uh, anyways, there's, there's a genealogy that goes from Adam all the way to Noah. I believe that's Genesis chapter 9. And when you do what I just showed you here, with a, uh, you add when they were a certain age, they had this person, when that person was a certain age, they had this person. When you add them all together, what you get is a really interesting thing because one of those persons in that lineup from Adam all the way to Noah is there's a person in, the, in kind of the middle of it, Methuselah. Um, and does anybody know anything about Methuselah? He's the oldest man. He died at 969 years old, right? Well, here's the thing. If you do the math from Adam to his son, to his son, to his son, to his son, and then you get to Methuselah, and you look at how old he was when he had his son, and his son, and his son, and his son, and you get to Noah, one of the things you begin to find in your charting of the genealogy is this really concerning thing. It says, Noah was a certain amount of age old, I forgot, if he was 600 or 400 or whatever, forgive me, I'm, it's, I'm not a walking calculator right now, but um, uh, if, if Noah was a certain age when the flood occurred and it gives that year, what if anybody else in his prior lineup here, remember how many people ended up in the ark? Only eight people, Noah, his wife, and his sons and their wives, what if anybody prior to this lived beyond when the ark had occurred and the great flood had occurred? When you do the math, what you find out is the genealogies are precise to the T. Methuselah dies the very year that the ark or that the flood occurs. Now, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say if he died in the flood, if he actually got taken away by the waters of the flood, or if he died sometime during that year before the flood came, just of old age. But what's really interesting is even the genealogies and all the numerical values demonstrate that uh, the word of God and all the details within the word of God line up with the facts that it presents. I want to share with you these things, not because you're going to run home and go, whoa, this is awesome. Now I've got something I can actually believe in. <laughs> We've got things we can believe in because the word of God has given us enough proof that we can have faith to put logic uh, and reasoning with what the word of God says, with what we know from history and the reality of who Jesus Christ was, to know that the word of God is telling the truth. But every little bit of detail demonstrates that actually the word of God is not made up myth, legend, fairy tale, uh, or... or um, well, you get the idea. Um, poetry, just poetry, it is precise even in its genealogies. So next time you're, you tend to just rush over those, those passages, I understand they're not really that exciting to go and apply to your life, but they're there for a reason. And when you look at the reason why they're written, it, it benefits your faith to recognize that the word of God is accurate to a T. So um, God calls a man in Genesis chapter 12 named uh, Abram, and it says that he called him out of Ur. And now we don't know exactly where Ur is. Some believe it was actually down in the plain of Shinar area, but it does say that he was, uh, he was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. And the area of Chaldea is up here, and it's believed that Abram came from the, the upper area here where the Tigris and the Euphrates kind of come together. Um, and, and Abram, it says in uh, Joshua chapter 24, Abram used to worship false gods. He was, uh, he was just like anybody else during this period of time. Uh, the, the knowledge of God had been pa passed down incorrectly and wrongly, and people were worshiping varieties of different gods based off of the seasons and based off of nature and stuff. And God came to Abram. Do you remember in chapter 12, uh, he said this, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I'm, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will also bless those who bless you, and those who dishonor you I will curse. And in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
real quick, now I didn't warn you to listen up, but I want you to tell me, what are some of the things that God promised in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 to Abram? Yes, uh, let's go with you first. Yep. What's that, a great name? All right, I will make your name great. Family, a great nation. Uh, who else is up? Yep, uh, great. You will, bl- yeah, God will bless those who bless you. Anybody else? Yep. Very good, yes. And he likewise curse those who curse you. Say it again. Numerous descendants. That's a good one. Yep. Numerous descendants. There's one more thing. It has to do with the strategic location God put them. I will give you, I think this is in there. Um, I will ah, I will go from the country. Oh, it's actually not a promise. So that technically you're right by not bringing this one up, but it does show up later. To the land that I will give you. So there's land. This is the beginning of many, many times that God shows up to Abram, and God shows up to Isaac, and God shows up to Jacob, and he restates this over and over and over. But it's over the course of decades and decades and decades. I will make your name great. I will make your family a great, and actually the idea is a large nation, numerous. So out of you will come a huge nation. Not only that, I will give you a land, and number three, not only will I bless, the, I will, I'll protect you, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, but you will become a blessing to the nation's around you. Actually, to all the nations of the world. I, I, I kind of limited it by saying around you. So, um, so mainly we could say a nation, a place, and a blessing are the three promises that God continues to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the rest of Israel. This is what's called the Abrahamic Covenant And it is a special promise that God made with his people. Um, And let me just take a moment here to explain that, or to uh, let somebody else explain it through a video. I want to make sure I got the right one here. Um, Let's see if, oh man. I I didn't have sound when I was setting these clips up, so forgive me. Uh, If this isn't the exact right one yet, I will, uh, we'll see in just a second here. Yep, okay. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews chapter 11. This is Beersheba, a modern growing city on the threshold of the desert in the south of Israel. The Bible speaks of Beersheba as the southernmost part of ancient Israel. At the opposite end of Israel is the ancient city of Dan in the north. The Bible refers to the entire country with the phrase, from Dan to Beersheba. Here Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, lived and received a covenant from God. And here the children of Abraham lived after him, looking to God for a great promise, waiting on him through endless days in the desert. Avner Bosky, an Israeli teacher of the Bible and history, has lived in Beersheba for more than 13 years. When Abraham came to the desert, and he was living here in the desert, 
we read the Bible and it all kind of gets telescoped real close, like an accordion when it's closed. But Abraham actually spent years and years where he never heard from God. And if you look in the book of Genesis, you'll see sometimes it could have been 10, 12, 15 years before God spoke to him dramatically. It happened again and again, but there were huge gaps. And where was he during that time? He was faithfully taking care of his sheep and his goats and his donkeys and his camels. And so there was a lot of life that we pass over in Genesis that Abraham lived that isn't actually there, but it's what the rabbis call the white letters, the, the spaces between the black letters there. There we go. There's a lot that happens in the book of Genesis that, um, that we always get the snapshots of the really important times when God shows up. But there's many, many years in which the people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they had to live by faith. God promised them something, and then they wouldn't have heard from God for many, many years, but they would have had to follow through by faith. Well, um, that, that what he said was true. And that's where, when God called Abram out of Ur, and he traveled to Haran with his family. Uh, you'll remember that Terah was Abram's father, and Terah had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, uh, Haran. and Haran, oops, <laughs> it's not my teeth, it's the, it's the marker here, just a second, uh, I'll give that, I'll go with the easier one to open. Haran, actually, he died and his successor to his inheritance was his son, Lot. And it says that Abram and Terah and Nahor and Lot, they traveled to Haran from Ur. The whole family left it. And what's interesting is that the time period in which this occurs, there was a migration of many peoples out of the, the uh, Mesopotamian area into this northern part of the Fertile Crescent. And what's interesting is from, from, our, uh, from scriptures, it says that Lot and Abram, they joined together and they traveled farther than Haran as God showed up to Abram and said, I want you to, to leave your family. I want you to leave your inheritance. And what's he saying even when he says, I want you to leave, um, uh, I want you to leave your father's house. Many commentators believe that he's saying, I want you to leave your father's house. Uh, everything that your house is, is connected with. Uh, Haran, or excuse me, Terah had household gods. He had localized gods that they would call on. And what God was saying to Abram when he shows up to him is, I want you to leave everything that gives you security, your father, your family, your inheritance of land, your gods, and I want you to follow me to a new land that I will show you and I give you, but I'm not, show, I'm not giving you the map right now. And Abram left. And he left with Lot, and he traveled uh, south. And it says that he, let me get rid of this overlay here, just so we can, oops, I just added another one. There we go. And it says he came to a place called Shechem, and he built an altar to the Lord. Then he came farther down south, and he came to a place called Bethel, which means the house of God, and he built another altar to the Lord. And later... Um, if I, in, in another chapter, he comes to a place called Hebron, uh, where there were oaks, uh, oak trees, and he built another altar to the Lord. And then he went down south to the Negev and to a city later that he, that's founded uh, called Beersheba, uh, the, the, the place of the well or the seven, seven wells or something like that. Um, and, and later he, built, he calls on the name of the Lord, and it's believed that he builds an altar to the Lord. Why do you suppose Abram built altars as he traveled all the way south through the land of Israel that God was showing him it was his future land? Any guess? Yep. Find his way back. Altars were similar to landmarks. Altars were also si uh, similar to um, posting a claim to an area. Now, the land of Canaan was inhabited by who? Hint. Canaanites, yes. Out of, 
uh, not out of Shem's line, uh, not out of the, uh, this group, but out of Ham's line. Ham had a son named Canaan, and Canaan had many sons, per, uh, per, uh, Perizzites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the, and, and all those ites, actually the ites just mean a family name. Those people settled in this land, and God said, I am giving you this land. And as Abram went to each of these key cities, he was putting claims of these altars to God throughout the land. And later, the people could come back, his, his ancestors could come back and find these, these markers, kind of like when we go to uh, the moon. What do we set down on the moon to show that we've been there? An American flag, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you go to Mount Everest and you're one of the few people that get to the top and have made the dangerous trek, what do you put? A flag of sorts. This was, so to speak, a flag for God in the land. It was demonstrating God's ownership and actually God's covenant promise to Abram. Well, in chapter 15 of Genesis, something really important happens. Um, and I'm going to illustrate it this way. I'm going to read it first, and then I want you to, un to understand what goes on here because it sets the course for the rest of the book. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vis vision. He said, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield, and your reward will be very great. But Abram said, oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I can, I'm, I'm childless. <laughs> um, you promised me that I'd have a great family and nation, and I'd be the blessing to the nations. But I'm single, more or less. I've got my wife in me, and that's it. How can, how can that happen? And um, uh, he says, you've given me no offspring. And the word of the Lord came to him. This uh, Eliezer, your servant, will not be your son or your heir, because uh, there was a practice that's actually uh, documented during this time that you could take a servant and make that person your future heir. But uh, he said, uh, look up into the stars that I'm showing you. He took, they were outside, and the stars were as numerous as could be. There was no smog at that time. And he says, this is how great, how many, how large the amount of people that will come from your, your, um, your ancestry will be. And then he said, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. And, the, and Abram said, well, how am I to know that, uh, that I shall possess it? And God said this, bring me a heifer. What's a heifer? A cow. Um, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. And he brought all these three, and he cut them in half, and he laid them half over against the other, opposite of each other. And he did not cut the birds, however, um, but when the birds of prey came down on the carcass, Ab Abraham drove them away. As the sun was going down, Abraham, a great sleep came upon Abraham, uh, Abram, excuse me, at this point. He didn't get his name changed. And God said this, know for certain that your offspring shall be sojourners, they'll, they'll be travelers in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. They will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment upon the nation that they serve. What is God predicting right now in this passage? Yep. The slavery in Egypt. This promise occurred around, two, uh, around 2100 B.C., and the slavery that happened to the Israelites happened around after um, 1800 BC. God's predicting something that 200 years from now, from this point, would not have, have uh, even been imaginable to Abram since he didn't even have any children at that point. Anyways, uh, and then the amazing part that happened was when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river of Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kezites, the Kadmonites, the Hiv Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Okay, so the significance of this is what he asks him to bring some animals and to cut them up. Okay, that's really bizarre. Abram goes and gets these animals. He takes a knife and he cuts these things, and he puts these animals that he cuts, <laughs> and he, he puts them opposite, the pieces of these animals opposite of each other. Oh, I don't, have a, I don't have enough blood for this one here. All right, we'll put that one there. And can you imagine? This was a costly exercise as Abram had a goat, as he had his cattle, and as he cut these things up, and he wondered... 
Why would God do this? Well, actually, it was a normal custom to do something like this. Okay, it wasn't something you did every day. This was a serious thing. Here you've got a line of gory, bloody animal pieces that have been chopped in half, except for the, except for the birds. And, and what was supposed to happen? An agreement, a covenant was going to be made. Uh, Nathaniel, why don't you come up here real quick? What would happen is, if I wanted to make a serious agreement, a promise with somebody, but it required something of the other person as well, this is, I know it's weird for us, but in ancient Near Eastern customs, is all right? You would take the person's, you would do this, you would take the person's hand, and you would walk through this gory trail of blood, and the idea was this, if you don't keep your part of the bargain, may this happen to you. <laughs> if I don't keep this part of this bargain, may this happen to me. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, and so the idea of cutting a covenant was this. This was a serious offense to break the agreement. Now, from what I just read, what's significant about the covenant that was made that was different than what I just demonstrated with my son? Only God passed through. Now, when you make a covenant, when you make a promise with somebody, normally it's two people promising something to make an agreement to each other that requires both of them to keep the end of the bargain. But in this case, God made Abram sleep, and God himself walked through in, in the form of, of fire and cloud of smoke. Um, he walked through this, in essence, communicating May this happen to me if either of us don't keep our end of the bargain. Now, Jesus Christ, I recognize, was not cut in two and split up like that. But he was pierced for our, our transgressions. He was killed for our sins and our iniquities. God kept his covenant that he made with Abram, and he demonstrated it by him being the one taking full responsibility. Now, recognize this was made to a man who the, hu the, uh, the, the human counterpart, uh, the, the, the descendants of this was the nation of Israel. And so God kept his bargain with Israel. Even when Israel, over and over and over in the, in the Old Testament, it, uh, it gives the account over and over and over, Israel failed God. But guess what? God is the one who took the punishment upon himself. Now, there were consequences for, Abraham, uh, for Israel's failings, but it, um, this trail of blood, this cutting of a covenant is significant because it demonstrates that, it's, that this, this covenant that God made with Abram was unconditional. Abram's descendants, Israel, didn't have to do anything. Uh, well, they, they did have to... to um, under the Mosaic Covenant, there were things that they had to keep in order to stay in the land, in order to receive God's blessing. But according to this, the land and, the, and uh, the fact that he would make them a great nation and be a blessing to the nations, God was taking the responsibility upon himself. The amazing part is, the nation of Israel's existence today, the fact that the Hebrew people still uh, are maintained and they're now, they're back in their land and they have a nation, demonstrates, and there, there are millions of Jewish people around the world, but even in Israel, demonstrate God keeps his promise even when his own people betrayed him and when they even kill his own Messiah. God keeps his promises to us even when we fail him. God knows how much goes on in our lives where we succumb to temptation, where we give in to the hatred and to bitterness or to um, the filth of this world. And he himself, because he has, has provided a covering for us, an unconditional covering of, of Jesus Christ and the cross, if we come under by faith, Jesus Christ's gift of salvation that we're a free pardon on the cross, he will continue to give that and he will continue to um, um, cleanse us from our sins 
when we demonstrate that we have faith in his son. It's an amazing God that we serve because no other God that humanity has ever crafted in human, humankind's minds and, and in the ways that you look at all the world religions of the past and even the present, there is no God that demonstrates that type of grace and forgiveness and freedom that's experienced through a, a gory thing such as a covenant made on a cross in which his own son had to die for our sins, where one who was blameless took the blame upon himself so that we might have a relationship with him. It's incredible. So what I wanted to highlight real quick then was that Abram spends a lot of time traveling through the land and he ends up in the uh, Negev desert. There was a drought and he had to go to Egypt uh, where Egypt was a place in which it was not very susceptible to drought and it was because of a river. The Nile River flows uh, from, from down, south, uh, down south in Africa. It actually flows north in a northern direction. It doesn't go against gravity. Remember, north or south doesn't mean that something's higher or lower. Uh, actually, down south in Egypt, it's higher. And the waters uh, from the mountains and, and, and rivers and springs and stuff, they, uh, they, they flow up the Nile River and they come out in this very flat land and the silt and the water spread out and it makes this a fertile area in which there's always food. Always. Rarely does Egypt have a famine and a drought because of the Nile not doing its thing. Now we know that there, that happened for seven years at a particular point. Yes? Oh, yeah. Um, that was a very unusual thing. And in fact, it makes it into the history books of Egypt, um, the, the, uh, the droughts that occurred. And so we can, there's, there's a way to pinpoint uh, the times when, when jo Joseph could have been in Egypt. But what's interesting about the land of Israel is it doesn't have a water source that is dependable. Now, there is a mountain up, way up north here. And you can kind of see the height of this mountain, it's called Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon has snow on it during certain times of the year. And there's four springs that come out and it waters this, what used to be like a swamp, uh, the swampy gully right here. That, that was a large valley, it's called the Hula Valley. Um, and it, and it uh, washes through this, this teeny, teeny little uh, area right here called the Rosh Pina Salt. Uh, and it's uh, mainly volcanic flow that, that uh, eroded over time. And it flows into this lake that we know from a lot of New Testament uh, accounts called the Lake of Galilee. The Lake of Galilee then washes, uh, fills up and it flows out into this, this flat landed, uh, this flat basin right here in a squiggly river all the way down south as it travels um, over 225 miles squiggled. It travels just 65 miles in length. Uh, as it descends, the Earth's crust goes deeper and deeper and deeper to the lowest place on Earth, which is, um, this is called the Jordan Valley. And as you're going farther south, and as you're getting deeper down into the Earth's crust, um, as, and away from where the, the, the clouds are able to uh, maintain their moisture, this area is just desert as can be. There's barely, barely any water, except the water that comes down from the Jordan River, into what we know as, whoops, uh, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea doesn't have any outlet. It is just a, 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 a body of water in which uh, it receives a lot of the, uh, the water from everywhere else on this side. Uh, there's springs that come out, and it used to be a lot of springs that would come out this area, and it made this area a very fertile place. In fact, just for the sake of time, I'm going to, uh, to just give you a few... Um, just so we can, here we go. Uh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to move ahead to Genesis 19, where Abram is at the uh, at Hebron in the Oaks of Mamre, and remember he's visited by three people, and one of it says that it's the, one of those persons is the Lord, and the two other are angels, right? And they take Abram out, or actually they have a discussion about Abram having a child named Isaac, and there's this laughter and mocking that goes on. He goes, you know what, you're laughing now, but by this time next year, you're going to have a son, okay? And then they go out, and he says, you know, should I tell Abram what I'm planning on doing? And they say, yeah, probably, let's, let's, or I'm going to tell you, Abram, what I'm doing. And I, I'm, we're actually going to go 
over here to Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities where your, your nephew, um, Lot, have settled because there was, there was not enough farm, there was not enough pasture land for, uh, for Lot and Abram at the same time. And he says, I'm going to destroy these cities because the wickedness that has come up from these cities is great. It's believed that Gomorrah might be the city that was found down here, what's, what uh, is called Numeria. It's believed possibly that Zoar is, uh, is this city right here and that uh, Adama was uh, even further south. I think I missed one of them. There we go, Sodom. There's another settlement right here called Bab Edra. It's the, the what do you call it, the Arabic name. Uh, what's interesting about these places, and if you have your handout and you're, you're, you're following along, this is page 10, 11, uh, recorded in Genesis. I'm going to flip over there real quick to my handout. Oops, let's go to page 11. Recorded in Genesis 18, the Lord, three angels visit uh, Abram uh, at, at Hebron to confirm that he would have a child. Yep. The three angels came to Sodom and encountered Lot, who was sitting at the, the city gate, which was a position of influence. Uh, and he was very hospitable. You remember that the angels told Lot and his family of their mission to destroy the city, and Lot must flee to the mountains. Lot didn't want to flee, but after some bargaining and, uh, and convincing, Lot uh, had actually um, was convinced them to allow him to go to the small city of Zoar. And so um, if, uh, so, uh, he was in Sodom up here, and Zoar was down here, we believe. And um, the God rained fire and brimstone from heaven. Uh, he overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and all the inhabitants in the valley and, and that which grew on the ground. And Lot's wife behind him looked back and was judged by becoming a pillar of salt. Now some people say, oh, come on. This is a person becoming a pillar of salt? That, that's myth. That's legend. That's like, you know, <laughs> ogres when the sunshine comes up, they become stone. How many of you have seen ogres that are stone? You know, it's like, oh, a woman becoming a pillar of salt? Well, what's really interesting is if you look at what this is describing, number one, um, it talks a lot about the fact that there are pits of tar um, and that there was sulfur and bitumen, or we, we call that also brimstone, uh, that's in this area. This area that, um, that, that these cities are recorded as being in is highly, highly volcanic. This area is on two made is between two major tectonic earth plates one is traveling north the other is traveling south and that's why this is the deepest place on the earth is because there's enormous amounts of um, uh, tectonic or volcanic activity that's happening in this this place and so what you find is actually volcanic rocks you find bitumen you find um, asphalt which is like tar and rocks mixed together, you find also enormous amounts of sulfur. And so the biblical account matches what we find geologically, but also on top of that, this area is filled with these uh, deposits and these, these um, areas in which there was um, highly concentrated salt mounds. And it's possible that when God through his wrath upon these cities, it's possible that also some major upheavals were going on and the salt, uh, these, these highly concentrated pools of salt water were thrown around and these, these glops of salt perhaps covered uh, Lot's wife and made her into a pillar or a mound of salt. Um, it fits the biblical account. You always imagine that this woman's running away going... <gasps> And she all of a sudden becomes like salty and then, you know, a, a, a desert deer comes by and licks her and her arm falls off. And you're like, oh, wow, that's really weird. No, that's not what this is describing necessarily. What this may be describing is actually absolute terror of God's wrath occurring and her looking back, wishing to, to stay and God knowing her heart and God judging her by <laughs> putting this molten, saltish stuff on her and making her into a salt mound. Um, that doesn't mean that her body ceased to become human. It just means somewhere in this area, if you were to chip away, <laughs> you'd probably find some bones of some lady. All right, you got the idea. So Abram, real quick, Abram had a son. What was the son's name? Laughter, you're right. Isaac, Isaac. That's what Isaac's name means. It's like a way of laughing, onomatopoeia, 
where, remember, bubble, 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 that word sounds like what it describes. Um, weeping sounds like crying. Isaac is the Hebrew way of laughing. Isaac, Isaac. All right, so don't forget that. Isaac means laughter, good. And Isaac had a son. Actually, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now, I don't have time to go through all the details, and so I'm, that's why I'm zipping through this. A, Jacob and Esau, and which of them did God choose? Jacob. Jacob was chosen to continue the, the, the chosen line of bearing God's blessing and bearing the nation, the, uh, the, the future nation of, of Israel, as well as receiving the land. Now, Esau's family became um, the people that we now know as the, whoa, I, I went way too far south. There we go. The people of Edom, and Edom, uh, Esau's uh, inheritor, Esau's lineage, his ancestors, uh, they became problems for Israel. Uh, but anyways, uh, then e and Jacob's name at some point was changed to what? Israel. Now, what does the name Jacob mean? Now, Isaac means laughter. Nina? What, uh, robber? Grabber? Very close. Actually, it has something to do with the, the surplanting. Yes, very good. Yeah? Trickster. Trickster. He grabbed. Deceiver. All those concepts work together excellently with what the name Jacob means. Now, there's a certain point, I'm not going to go through all of Jacob's history, but I, I just want to run you through these things so when we get to key points, I can, I can explain a little more that sometimes we, uh, as an overview of Scripture, that's what we're doing uh, here. Um, I want to get you to this, this idea. <laughs> Jacob, God had to explain to him the same covenant, and he did it in a few different ways, and there's several encounters that God had with Jacob. One of them, can you tell me what, what an, an encounter God had with Jacob? Yep. When they were wrestling, God met a man, and the man was, was wrestling uh, with him, and we find out this man was more than a man, because Jacob says to him, um, what is your name? And the man says, oh, wait, wait, don't, I will not let you go until you give me a blessing. And, and they have this discussion, and, um, and that's when actually, if I remember right, that's when God uh, changes his name. Oh, yeah, the, the man calls him, he says, your name right now is Jacob, but you, I will change your name to Israel, or Israel, um, one who has wrestled with God and won. That's quite a bold name to give somebody, especially since nobody can beat God in a wrestling match, right? <laughs> but remember, God had the last laugh, so to speak, and he, he touched him on the hip, so then always, uh, he had a shorter uh, limp, uh, shorter sinew, and he would limp. Um, there was another encounter that God had with Jacob. Do you remember it? Yep. Yes. He was actually fleeing from his brother Esau, and he got to a place called Bethel, which is right here, if we could make it bigger. He got to the same place where there was an altar. By the way, Jacob has been in, in Beersheba. He was in Hebron, and he was at Bethel, fleeing from Esau, and that's where he saw the angels of God ascending, going up, and descending, going down. It was kind of like, an, uh, not an escalator, they weren't climbing like a ladder like this, but they were traveling back and forth to heaven. God allowed him to see that, but there was a particular purpose to that. Um, and right now, I am forgetting the purpose of that, but we're just going to leave it at that. Uh, I'm Lord God. Whoops. Now, Jacob, oh, rats. But, what I want to, uh, <laughs> what I want to fin finish up with here tonight is the fact that Abram, uh, excuse me, uh, Isaac wanted to make sure that Jacob ended up marrying right. And Esau ended up marrying um, Canaanite women. And it says something really interesting in the Bible here. It says, um, <laughs> it says that the son Esau, when Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Beri, and the Hittite, that's a Canaanite, to be his wife, and Basmath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. His choice of who he married and how many wives he married <laughs> and where he married them from and what their lives were about actually made 
their, his parents, mom and dad, Isaac and, and uh, Rebecca, bi the bitterness of soul, it made them very sick inside. And it says, Rebecca said to Isaac, I loathe, I hate my life because, the hit, because of the Hittite women. Who? <laughs> the Hittite women that are my daughter-in-laws is the idea. If Jacob marries one of those Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be then? So she sent him north to where their family had settled, where Nahor and some of the other uh, descendants of Terah had been settled, and, and that's where they, apparently they had been God worshippers much better than the, the Canaanite knights. Uh, although we find out that, um, <laughs> that the, his wife, uh, Jacob's wife, ends up stealing her dad Laban's um, household gods and takes them down south. And at a certain point, Jacob has had enough of God's influence where he, has, where he tells his family something really important. He tells his family, lift your eyes and see all the goats, oh, no, 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 that's what God says to him. Uh, just a second, there was a really cool spot. Here we go. Um, he says to God, I am not worthy. Um, uh, please deliver me from the hand of my brother. He, he gets humbled, and God delivers him, and he tells his family, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves, change your garments, and let's arise and go to Bethel, that I will make there an altar to God who answers me in the day of my distress. And he has been with me there wherever, uh, he's been with me wherever I've gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods and all the rings, and apparently they had religious significance, and he, and he disposed of those things. And so what's really interesting, and what I wanted to kind of highlight and get in your heads as you begin to read, I'm... I hope that you guys begin to read through the stuff that we're, we're talking about, and, and this is inspiring you so that when you read it, you come up with more questions, and we can have those discussions, but also you become familiar with the locations of things. Um, and so as we finish up here, what you'll notice is there's these roads that they go through. Be Beersheba, I didn't mark it here. Beersheba is a regular um, place that they settle. Hebron, the Oaks of Mamre. Bethel shows up a lot, and Shechem. And it's these particular locations that Abram, Isaac, and Jacob continually encounter God at. I'm so grateful that we serve a God where we don't have to go to a location to meet with him. We come to this building and to this room to celebrate and to enjoy the, the excitement of, of what it means to worship God together as a body that's redeemed under Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of church. But we don't have to come to this room to meet with our God. Isn't that amazing? Because there are religions that teach that you actually have to go somewhere and do something to get your God's attention. Our God loves every single one of you. And he wants to commune. He wants to fellowship. He wants to enjoy a relationship with you. And he started that out by dying for you, on, uh, by having his son die for you on the cross, by giving his son so that your sins might be made, um, be put on the cross, on Christ, and Jesus Christ might put his righteousness on you. I'm going to assume that you all knew that, know that, as I've had discussions with a bunch of you about that. But that doesn't mean that's the end of it. God wants to continue to grow you deeper, just like he grows his relationship with the pagan Abram from very basic faith into growth, just like he takes Isaac from very basic faith and grows him deeper, just as he takes Jacob and has encounter after encounter after encounter. Now, God doesn't give us dreams these days. He doesn't have us meet um, in, in amazing visual uh, contacts. But he's given us so much already communication from himself. And he wants you to find out what he has said to you so you might commune, commune and talk with him and worship to him on your own as well as together when we meet weekly uh, as, as a body of believers. Our God pursues each of us because he wants you to have the joy of knowing what it's like to experience who he is and the freedom that comes from a relationship with him. And just because you failed 
doesn't mean you've disqualified yourself from that. Abram, Jacob, even Isaac lies and, and, and goofs up terribly. He sins. And God still wants that relationship. So no matter what you've done, no matter what you'll do, your God will continue to pursue you. And I encourage you, don't make that a difficult process, but enjoy him. Submit yourself to him because there's great freedom and joy found in experiencing a relationship with him. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the ways that you've taken, uh, the, uh, what you, how you've recorded in the scripture, um, the ways that you pr pursued this pagan man named Abram. And you've taken his family and you, you've raised them into a nation that we can see even today is a testimony that you keep your promises. The things we see in scripture only confirm the reality of what we, we see in, in, our la in, in, in the news as well as in, uh, in politics today even. Um, Lord, I pray that our takeaway from this might be a re realization and a recognition of the fact that you've pursued us and that the covenant that you've made with Jesus Christ, the new covenant uh, that has given us life where there's been death, where there's, given a, where there's been an exchange of our sin for your righteousness, that we would learn to cling to that and enjoy the freedom and fellowship that we have with you. Uh, vital, in, in, invigorate our walk, Lord. Help us not to see Christianity as, as dry and dull and boring and a list of rules and regulations, but help us to see that this relationship is, is deep and, it, and, it, and it's full of life and, and excitement of joy as we experience that your mercies are new each morning. I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray.